Good afternoon, everyone. I want to make sure everyone can hear me. My name is Wendy Cromash, and we are in for a treat today. Uh, we will be having a uh, hearing from and seeing a PowerPoint presentation from Michelle Nichols, uh, who is the director of public observing. There she is, um, director of public observing at the Adler Planetarium. Uh, I have uh, just a couple announcements I want to make, and then uh, we will get right to Michelle's presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Wendy Cromash. I am on the board of the Levy Senior Center Foundation, who is uh, the Levy is the Levy Foundation is the uh, organization behind um, the Levy Lecture Series. They've been the primary um, supporter um, in every way for this wonderful series, and um, we owe them a big thanks for um, allocating the funds and just um, giving us the space to do this. Um, oh, I also wanted to mention um, a couple of things. There should be closed captioning um, for those of you who would like to use it. Uh, the, um, it's an option if you don't want to use it. There should be something at the bottom of your screen that you can uh, click so that you don't have to look at it. Um, I know we got a couple of comments about that last time. Also, um, please don't use the raise hand function because I, I don't access that and will not be able to respond. If you need to reach me, if you have questions that you would like Michelle to answer, um, please use the Q&A function at the bottom. And um, let me just introduce our talented speaker, who I am thrilled to welcome back for our second appearance here. Michelle is the Director of Public Observing at the Adler Planetarium. She has held that role, uh, that position, for more than 26 years. She coordinates public observing programs at the Adler, including scopes in the city, uh, Donut Dusk, and Galaxy Ride, and the Adler's annual public observing and public outreach tri traveling science roadshow. Uh, she has another upcoming um, virtual event that she will tell you about, and uh, we have a lot going on in space these days. So. Without any further ado, welcome back. Thank you very much. And thanks for the uh, note about the subtitles. And I turned mine off because um, I, I, I probably will be slightly uh, distracted by trying to see what the system is going to turn some of the words into that I'm going to say. So <laughs> apologies if some of it turns out a little strangely. Um, it's, it's sometimes interesting to see what uh, what words get captured and, and transmitted. So um, thank you for coming, everyone. I can see there is a very large number of participants joining us. And um, so I'm so great, grateful that you decided to spend a little time today doing some science with me. So um, my name is Michelle Nichols, and I work at the Adler Planetarium. We've been closed since March. We are still closed to the public, keeping everybody safe. So I'm really glad that I have this opportunity to come to you. Um, and still talk about science, even though the Adler's doors must remain closed until it is safe for us to reopen. So we hope that is uh, sometime in the in the near-ish future. Um, I don't have an exact date for any of that. Uh, but Wendy did mention that we are going to be doing a virtual program. So it'll be an online program live to YouTube on the Adler Planetarium's YouTube channel. So it's youtube.com slash Adler Planetarium. It is uh, Thursday, February 18th from 1 to 3 p.m. Central Time. And that is coinciding with the landing of the Perseverance rover on Mars. And so um, one way or another, this thing is getting to Mars on February 18th. And as Wendy and I were talking uh, before the program started, it will either arrive in one piece 
or it will, it will arrive in many pieces. Either way, it's getting to Mars at approximately 2.45 p.m. Central uh, on, on February 18th. So we're going to have a program uh, showing people all about Mars and um, we'll be doing it, fingers crossed, from the Adler. So uh, we'll have a little bit of leeway to be able to go down there. We're not inviting anybody from the public to come. It's just us on site. Uh, but we'll be broadcasting live uh, and showing people some of the exhibits we have about Mars and talking about Mars and answering viewer questions. And so it should be pretty exciting. Um, but today we are talking about Mars writ large and also uh, the upcoming rover mission uh, because it is pretty exciting. But we have a long history of being um, attentive to Mars and, and trying to figure out what that planet is all about. Um, so let me share my screen. So give me just a second. And what I'll do is, uh, the way this will work is I'll, I'll do a few slides, maybe 10, 15, something like that. And then I'll stop sharing. I'll, I'll go to see, oh, actually, no, I take that back. No, we're going to wait for questions at the end. That's right. This, that's how we do this one. Sorry. Um, so as you think of questions, put them in the Q&A. Um, and so we'll get to the questions at the end and uh, I'll just do the, the running tally. So if, as you think of a question, definitely uh, put it into the, uh, the Q and A and we will get to it. So again, thanks for coming. All right. So I call this one roving the red planet. Now it isn't just rovers or wheeled robots that we send to Mars. We've sent a variety of spacecraft, uh, but Mars has been a place that we have studied with our telescopes and with our eyes for a very long time. Now, some things that we do know about Mars in general, just to give us a sense of, of uh, what the planet is like. So we've got the first four planets from the sun here, not to distance scale, but to size scale approximately. So the planet to the far left is uh, Mercury, then Venus with its clouds removed, then Earth, of course, and then Mars to the right. So as you can see, Mars is about half the size of Earth. Um, or put another way, Mars is about half the size of Earth and our moon is about half the size of Mars. So if you look at our moon in the sky, if Mars were in the exact same location, uh, it would be about twice the size. So um, it gives you a, a sense of what the size scale of that place would be. If Earth was a hollow ball and you filled it with Mars marbles, you'd fit about six Mars marbles inside. So the volume of one Earth equals about the volume of six um, planet Mars. Sorry, Mars in plural. Anyway, um, if you take just the land mass of Mars, the, 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 the actual uh, surface of the planet, and you compare it to Earth, it's about equal to the landmass above water on Earth. Now, that sounds impressive until you realize that about 70% of Earth is covered in water. So it sounds like a lot of landmass, but it's, it's a surprisingly uh, small amount uh, in total. So we tend to forget, even though our planet is called Earth or Terra, maybe its better name could be water or aqua because we are covered mostly in that stuff. Um, anyway, but it's, it's water that is what scientists have been interested in and, and trying to, to look for on Mars. More about that in just a sec. The gravitational pull of Mars is about one third that of Earth. Meaning, if you go to Mars and you step on a scale, you'll weigh about one third of what you weigh now. You're still made of the same amount of stuff. It is not a, it, it's not a weight loss where you would be actually uh, getting rid of some of yourself. It's just the gravitational pull is less there. Um, so a hundred pound person on Earth would weigh 38 pounds on Mars, so slightly more than a third uh, of the gravitational pull of Earth. Mars is the fourth planet from the sun. And so we have Mercury and Venus first, then Earth, then Mars. So Earth is a little less than 100 million miles from the sun on average. It's not always that number, but it's on average about that number. And uh, the distance to Mars is almost 150 million miles. So about one and a half times the distance that the Earth is from the sun. What that means is the sun is smaller in the sky. Mars receives less energy from the sun. 
overall, Mars is a colder planet than Earth. There's a variety of reasons for that. It's not just distance. Um, but overall, on average, you're going to get an average temperature that's less on Mars than you do on Earth. Now, how much less? Well, quite a bit less. So uh, the average temperature on Earth, um, if you've got your highest to coldest temperature and daytime, nighttime temperature, essentially the overall average temperature of Earth is uh, 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Overall, the approximate average temperature on Mars is 81 degrees below zero. So it is a frigid place. Um, that 86 degrees Fahrenheit temperature sounds great until you realize it's really only at the equator and it's really only near the ground. Um, Mars has very little air to be able to hold in heat. So even though it says 86 degrees, that's not a balmy, comfy 86 degrees. Um, that's really uh, only at the, at the ground level, uh, really at the surface itself. Uh, even if you go just a few feet above the surface of Mars, there's so little air to hold the heat in that your temperature is going to drop from your feet to your head. We don't really have that problem here on Earth because we have enough air to mix the heat around. And so the temperature uh, from your feet to your head is probably the same temperature. So um, anyway, something really interesting to think about. Now, a, a typical average-ish day, um, Here's here's a, here's a snapshot of, uh, it wasn't necessarily today's weather forecast, it was uh, just a couple months ago, but the high temperature where the Curiosity rover is on Mars is a balmy 41 degrees, and the low temperature that same night was 90 degrees below zero. So again, so little air that even though it got up to 41 degrees, you can't really hold the heat in, and so you end up with a, a crash in the, in the nighttime air temperature. So anything we send to Mars has to take this into account, has to have some sort of heater on board to be able to account for this really drastic swing, uh, daytime to nighttime temperature, and then also summer temperature to winter temperatures. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty inhospitable place when, you're, when you start to think about it. Now thinking of hospitable versus inhospitable, it's not just temperature. It's also what resources are there. I'll talk more about that. Um, it is also uh, the kind of air that we have there. Could we walk out of the surface of Mars and breathe the air? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, on Earth, our, our atmosphere is mostly consisting of nitrogen, which we don't use. Plants do, but we don't. Oxygen, that's the part that our bodies use, and then 1% is other, and that 1% actually is, it fluctuates. Um, so that's not, the, those numbers don't say stay exact all the time. Um, but uh, when you are breathing in right now, you are breathing in nitrogen and oxygen, you are breathing out nitrogen and carbon dioxide. On Mars, um, the atmosphere is about 1 100th one the pressure at the surface of the Earth. So you have very little air pressure on Mars. Uh, and not only that, the air is mostly composed of carbon dioxide. So that, that waste product that you breathe out, that's what the air mostly consists of there. So if we want to be able to breathe on that planet, we have to carry the air with us or find some source that we can use that has oxygen that we can turn it into something we can breathe. Um, so this is turning into less and less of an Earth-like location. Um, that's one thing I always want to stress. Uh, I do give a, an occasional talk on climate change. And what I, what I stress to people at the beginning and especially at the end is, even though we like to say, oh yeah, we could pack up and go to Mars if, if there's a problem here. No, we really can't. First off, it's expensive, it's difficult. Only, we, we don't have that capability. And you have to think of Earth as your planet A, and there is no planet B. There is no other place like Earth in our solar system. Other places have a handful of characteristics like Earth, but nothing is truly Earth-like, uh, not even Mars. We, we, we like to say it is, but it really isn't. So it is a, a pretty harsh place, and whatever we send there has to take all these characteristics into account um, to be able to have our robots and our spacecraft and everything survive and be successful. Now, one thing that we really don't know much about 
is the center, the interior of Mars. We can see what the surface is like, but we, but we don't have a lot of information about what the interior is like. There is a NASA spacecraft um, that I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about. I have a, a couple of slides later on um, about it. It's uh, the um, InSight uh, spacecraft, and that is a lander that is currently measuring Mars quakes to be able to figure out what the interior structure uh, of the planet is like, because we don't have any information. You can't just look at the surface and just guess what the interior is like. You need some other way to do it. Um, and so that's what that spacecraft mission is all about. I'll, I'll show you just a little bit more about that one in, uh, in a little while. Mars has two moons named Phobos and Deimos, panic and fear. Uh, take a look at the sizes of these moons almost 14 miles in diameter, almost eight miles in diameter. What that means is you could stick these two moons within the boundaries of the city of Chicago and you will have room left over. These are tiny, tiny moons. Um, taking a look at Phobos just a little bit more, it looks a little strange. Um, take a look at those striations there. They look like they're coming from that big giant crater there on the right, but it, they're really not. What's happening is that moon is probably uh, getting some stretch marks and it's getting that because it is slowly spiraling in uh, as it orbits Mars. Sometime in the next 30 million to 50 million years, this moon is gonna get too close to Mars and the gravitational pull of Mars is going to tear it apart. What we think those long shallow grooves are that are lining the surface of this moon is the gravity of Mars is causing this moon to structurally fail already. Um, it still has 30 to 50 million years to go. This is not going to happen tomorrow. Um, but it only orbits about 3,700 miles from the surface of Mars. It is extraordinarily close uh, to the surface of the planet. So Mars's gravity is drawing it in uh, by about six and a half feet every 100 years. So 100 years from now, it'll be about six and a half feet closer. 100 years after that, it'll be about six and a half feet closer and so on. Um, so just think you can see already something that is going to happen in the far distant future. Um, you can see the evidence of that already um, from probably uh, this moon being starting to be pulled apart uh, by the gravity of Mars itself. So pretty neat to think about. Um, glad we won't be there when it actually happens. Well, actually, no, that'd be kind of a neat thing to see, wouldn't it? Um, from afar, that is. All right, let's take a look at the planet itself. So this is a fairly true color picture of the surface of Mars. It's, it's, we call it the red planet, but it's not really stop sign red. Um, it's more of a butterscotch color, and it has lots of different colors from dark gray um, to, to a lighter orangish color uh, across the surface, depending on what kinds of rocks and dust and stuff you're looking at. There, those three uh, splotches off to the left, those are tall volcanoes. Um, the planet itself looks like a dry desert. Um, and that, that crack across the middle is called Valles Marineris. It's uh, the deepest canyon on Mars. It, if you compare it to the Grand Canyon, the depth of the Grand Canyon is about a mile deep at its deepest. The, the depth of Valles Marineris at its deepest is almost five miles deep. Um, and so where this crack may have come from is uh, in the distant past, Mars may have had um, uh, more uh, more liquid water in its interior, um, and so and slowly that that water froze, and and expanded, and as we as we know around here, frozen water takes up a little bit more space than liquid water, and when that happens, you actually can get objects around here, especially if they're frozen and then they they melt. You can get that frozen that frozen ice can crack the exterior of say a flower pot or something like that. Um, this may have happened with this planet as well, is something liquid inside, uh, could be water, could be something else, froze, expanded, and actually cracked the surface of the planet. And we can see that as, as that humongous crack. We've seen this elsewhere in other places as well. Um, uh, Pluto's moon, Charon. Uh, 
may have had this happen as well. So interesting stuff to think about. Here's a, here's a, a close-up look at some of those volcanoes. Um, the largest one is up to the upper left. That is called Olympus Mons. It's the largest volcano that we know of in the solar system. If you take a look at it, it if you compare it to something you are more familiar with, um, we can compare it to Hawaii. And what's happening in Hawaii is you've got this magma, this liquid rock hotspot that's coming up from uh, the interior of the earth. And this volcano is erupting on the big island or it can erupt or it has erupted and the, the island itself has gotten bigger and bigger. Well, the crust of Earth is broken into plates and these plates move around on a liquid, on the surface of a liquid interior. And this crust moves from southeast to northwest. And so then you've got where these hot spots, this hot spot has, position has stayed the same, but the crust over the top of it, that position has changed. And so you can see that in the production of the Hawaiian islands where islands farther to the northwest are smaller and smaller because they are older and they've been eroded and the the big island is the youngest so far. Um, Olympus Mons same thing same type of volcano a hot spot has erupted but Mars did not have a moving crust it just wasn't big enough to generate that kind of activity um, its interior probably cooled off quickly. And so you just had this hot spot erupting in one spot over and over and over. And then what you end up with is a humongously tall mountain, a humongously tall volcano. Uh, this volcano is about 72,000 feet tall. Uh, and the diameter, the, the, this image here, I really like it because basically they've scaled the size of the picture of Olympus Mons to the diameter, if you take go from one end of the big island of Hawaii to the other end of Kauai. Um, so it's about that same distance. So that is a humongous volcano. It's about the same square mileage uh, as the state of New Mexico. It is about the same diameter as the state of Arizona. These are huge places. They are so tall that that clouds form almost daily around the tops of these volcanoes. Again, these are these are places where where we see cloud formation happening pretty often on the surface of Mars. And we see these clouds. These are water ice clouds. These were taken over the Curiosity rover as it sat or sits in Gale Crater um, uh, on Mars. And we can see these move across the sky. This looks practically Earth-like, right? Um, and so we do have a few characteristics of, uh, of, of Earth in the sky above Mars. All right, just a quick reminder, as you're thinking of questions, for those who might've joined late, as you're thinking of questions, please put them in the q and I, I see the tally going up. Don't worry, I will get to your questions at the end. And um, as you think of them, type them in the Q&A and I will gladly get to those. All right, now, We've been studying Mars with spacecraft since the early 60s, uh, ever since the Mariner 4 spacecraft and others followed, uh, the Viking missions and, and others. We used to think, I mentioned before, of Mars as a dry desert, but we started seeing evidence for past movement of what we think could have been liquid water on the surface. We started seeing that evidence decades ago. This is a Viking 1 image of the surface of Mars. and Gosh, if that doesn't look like a dried up river to me, I, I assume it looks the same to you too. If you think of what a, a meandering dried up river uh, looks like on earth, that's what that looks like. And so scientists first started asking themselves, uh, is was there liquid water on the surface of Mars in the past? There's obviously none there now. Um, here's another piece of evidence and there's there's much more besides this i'm not showing you the only two pieces there's there's many many other examples um but here's an example of a crater where the crater occurred and uh the the rock was compressed and made a little more dense and then water we think was flowing around this crater and that denser uh harder rock stayed and the the looser uh, less dense stuff uh, is where the water went and carved that channel around that crater. And they think that ridge there, that, that, that angled ridge, 
uh, is where the water had ponded or pooled and then it broke through the um, that ridge and flowed around the crater. At least that's sure what it looks like. Um, and so the, the goal for scientists is to figure out, was it really liquid water or was it some other mechanism that we don't truly understand that also or, or instead of could have created this this feature or these various features. So that's the goal of any scientific exploration is figure out if there is evidence for liquid water being there. And if it wasn't liquid water, what was it? Um, what was the process that was going on? So that's something that is ongoing exploration. But the, the, the goal of lots of these science missions has been uh, basically following the water. Where do we see the evidence of liquid water. And what I mean by that is when we take a look at the rocks and the features and all of that, we compare those to what we see on Earth and the processes to what we see happening on Earth. Do we think that's what happened on Mars? So we take Earth and we use that to compare Mars to, right? Um, so lots of examples have come up of, of water, liquid water and water ice. Um, by the way, quick uh, quick statement. I'm not being redundant when I say liquid water. Water is H2O. When I say liquid water, I'm start talking about the, the H2O that's coming out of your faucet. Water ice or solid water is the H2O that's in your freezer. And water vapor is the H2O that's coming out of your tea kettle. So it's um, water is really just the H2O and what state of matter am I talking about? Solid, liquid, or gas? In a lot of cases, we're seeing solid water ice on Mars. Here's an example. Um, this was two pictures of the same crater on Mars. Uh, so this was a, a fairly new crater. Uh, so it was photographed initially on October 18th of 2018 from a spacecraft orbiting Mars. And a few months later, they re-photographed that exact same crater. And as you can see, the ice disappeared. Basically, the ice vaporized. It went from a solid to a gas. We call that sublimation. So forgive me if I use the word vaporized. We can think of what that means. Um, that is, in this case, it's not liquid turning to gas. It is solid turning to gas. Um, but still, this, this ice was excavated um, uh, by that meteorite impact. And so over time, that ice turned from a solid to a gas. It used to be covered up and then it was made visible by the, the meteorite impact. There was another um, NASA spacecraft called Phoenix that landed closer to the Martian North Pole uh, around a little over 10 years ago. And what's really amazing is this thing had a scoop on it and basically they took the scoop and they stuck it in the ground and they scraped the scoop across the surface of the ground. So about two inches below the surface of, of, of the ground, uh, there's ice, water ice sitting right underneath uh, the surface of Mars. Mars, I mentioned, we thought it was a dry desert. We now know it's a frozen desert. There is water ice in many different places. Now this next map is gonna be a little confusing to start with. So forgive me, it's gonna take a tiny bit of, of explanation. So this is a, a round map of Mars flattened out. So that's first what that is. Secondly, the terrain of Mars is that gray image. Um, the, the purple, sorry, the red, indicates um, the place on Mars where um, you've got uh, a decent amount of, uh, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start over. The red, the green, the purple, the blue, everything here, you've got uh, water ice underneath the surface. Uh, the blue and the purple indicates water ice that's less than a foot below the surface. The red color is water ice that's two feet or more below the surface. So basically, if, you, if you've got the edges, the top and bottom edges of this picture, of this map, um, those are the poles. Then we've got water ice in those purpley areas that if you took a shovel and you walked out onto the surface of Mars and you stuck your shovel down and you shoveled, there'd be water ice right there. That's all you'd have to do is go a few inches down or so, less than a foot, and you would get to a supply of water ice. 
that's pretty amazing to think about. Now in those red areas, you just have to dig down slightly farther to be able to get to the water ice. Why do we care about this? Well, if you're gonna eventually land people on Mars, eventually we will land people on Mars. I don't know if it's gonna happen in my lifetime, probably not, um, but um, we're gonna have to find some resources to use there. You can't take a giant missions worth of water with you. You have to rely on the land when you get there. And in some cases, you're gonna have to rely on the water ice that's there to be able to melt it, to drink to be able to uh, break it apart into its components and use the oxygen for breathing, stuff like that. So water ice, this is why we're so keen to find this stuff because it is really, really important. Also, all life that we know of on earth needs liquid water to survive. If we're gonna attempt to search for life on Mars or evidence of past life on Mars, we need to know that liquid water was there. And then for how long? Um, but we do this in many different ways, and, and one way is we've, we've landed several landers on the surface of Mars, and where it says Mars 2020, that is where the uh, Perseverance rover, Mars 2020 was its original name, Perseverance is its nickname or its current name, uh, so you can refer to it either way. Um, so that is where it's going to land, uh, called, the place is called Jezero Crater. And um, so this is a rover, meaning it's a wheeled robot. So just to give you a sense of size scale, uh, the, the little guy there to the lower left, that is the Sojourner rover. And that's what landed in 1997. It's the size of a large boot box. Then we had Spirit and Opportunity. They were twins. They landed in January of 2004. That's the, the spacecraft to the, to the left of the people. And then the one to the right, is the Curiosity rover, and that's what landed in 2012. And each of these has wheels. Each of these lasted for a very long period of time. Curiosity is still operating. Spirit and Opportunity, unfortunately, no longer. Um, but the rovers have gotten bigger over time. Our capabilities have gotten better over time. And then what Perseverance will look like is almost a twin of Curiosity. It's just that the cameras will be different. The science instruments will be different. And so, uh, but basically you can take a look at Curiosity and see what Perseverance is gonna look like. Basically, we are gonna land something the size of a car on Mars uh, on February 18th, or that's the attempt. So we did it once before. We're going to use a very similar landing system to land this behemoth, this next one uh, on Mars on February 18th. Like I said, one piece or many pieces. Um, we'll see what happens. But uh, where we've seen evidence of uh, liquid water in the past is many, many, many places on Mars. Take a look at this picture. This is a place called Gusev Crater. Uh, the crater is the part there to, on, the, on the upper part of the image in the middle and it's that, that large crater. It is about the size of the state of Connecticut. And I don't know about you, but when I look at this thing, boy, that looks like a meandering river channel that emptied into that crater. And that's exactly what the scientists thought um, uh, as, as maybe what happened. If we take a close-up image of it, whoops, sorry. We take a close-up image of it and you can see uh, looks kind of like some broken rock like maybe the the river channel came through and pushed some rock out of the way right and then if we take a another image of it um and it it sure looks like at one point this thing could have been filled up by water now where the arrow is pointing is a place in the crater called Columbia Hills. Uh, this is where the Spirit Rover landed. It landed in the flat part, uh, kind of to the left of where that arrow is. And then it drove up into those hills. And along the way, it was testing rocks and testing rocks and every single rock it came upon was just your plain old ordinary volcanic rock, just a normal rock. And they're going, where's the evidence of the water? It sure looks like there was water here, right? Where's the evidence? They were not finding any until they drove up into the hills. And they decided to test a, a basically a trench in the dust that was made by one of Spirit's wheels. And they, they studied that, that whitish looking stuff. And what Spirit found, what the team found was um, uh, a material called silica. Silica is silicon dioxide. 
this is strong, strong evidence of liquid water. This stuff was so concentrated, it was about 90% silica. Water absolutely must have been involved in concentrating this amount of silica. You normally don't find that much just in your everyday uh, experience with silica. Um, we, they think what happened here was that it was a hot spring. Um, and so this was evidence that there was liquid water here. Um, these minerals that they studied and they found uh, included minerals that only form in the presence of water, that we don't know any other way to make some of those minerals than for liquid water to be involved. So what happened? It's believed that Gusev Crater may have held a lake long ago, but over time, volcanic dust and other rocks filled in the bottom of the crater. Spirit landed on the top of that filled in dust. We didn't land in the bottom, the actual bottom of the crater. It was all filled in. So the only way they found that evidence for liquid water is driving up into the hills that hadn't been covered over by all the dust yet. So really, really interesting to think about. Um, we've got other evidence of, of water flowing through the rocks. The picture on the right is, of course, Earth. There are no uh, Swiss Army knives on Mars, as far as I know. Um, but these rocks, uh, the picture on the, on the left is Mars. The, the rocks contain tiny cracks that are filled with a mineral called calcium sulfate. And so what's what's happening here is you've got this hot minerally water flowing through the cracks in the rocks. And then the water dried up, leaving the minerals behind. One form of calcium sulfate is known as plaster of Paris. Another is the mineral gypsum. And if you're not familiar with gypsum, you actually are if you've got drywall in your house, uh, that powdery stuff below the paper in your drywall, that's gypsum. So uh, you, you do have experience with this stuff and that's how we get gypsum and, and all that here on earth. And so we're pretty sure that that's how we got it on Mars. So more and more evidence for liquid water. Now this next one, I find fascinating. These look like uh, uh, river channels, but there's a scientist or a team of scientists that figured out that it, not quite all as it seems. Um, this is, take a look at the scale to the upper left, that, that line indicates one length of 500 meters or 1500 feet. Um, so this whole entire image is several miles in diameter. Let's take a close up look. And we've got a closer up image and it looks like little tiny pebbles. These are actually house size boulders. How did you get, how did we get these boulders in this image all being moved around and the answer is water in the form of a tsunami so maybe what happened was you had this shallow ocean in this location uh, a giant meteor struck from from space caused a huge what we would call tidal wave but it's a tsunami that moved these boulders around and carved these these water channels in a short period of time. And then you can see there's some craters. Those craters happened after uh, all this. So really amazing to start to piece together some of the evidence of liquid water being on the surface of Mars. Now where Curiosity landed is a place called Gale Crater. I mentioned that before. And then in the center of Gale Crater is this three mile tall mountain called Mount Sharp. And so Curiosity landed in the flat part. Of course, it's much easier to land on a flat spot. Um, so they land on the flat spot and they drive th toward the mountain. And the goal for that is to start driving up the mountain and testing the rocks along the way, not to get to the top of the mountain, that probably will never happen. But uh, presumably the rocks on the bottom of the mountain are older. The rocks up farther are younger. And as you study the rocks along the way, you can start to piece together a timeline of what was happening on Mars in this location um, by studying those rocks. And if they change, you know that the conditions changed in that part of Mars. So again, Curiosity landed in this flat spot and started driving toward the mountain. Along the way, of course, you take pictures and you take data and you study rocks along the way. And they came upon these rocks. The picture on the right is Earth. This is a, a, 
a place on Earth where you've got lots of rounded rocks that are kind of concreted together. Um, the picture on the right, or sorry, on the left, is rounded rocks that are concreted together. Right? The picture on the right is a dried stream bed on Earth in Chile. The picture on the right, sorry, I keep getting my, my directions mixed up. Picture on the right is Earth, a dried stream bed in Chile. The picture on the left is Mars, a dried stream bed on Mars. So what happened is um, you can see there is evidence for that, that channel. I think you can see my arrow um, that is carved through the side of Gale Crater and flows down into the crater. And then what likely happened is you had this river that sort of fanned out and the water pooled or ponded in the, in the crater. And so we see that evidence. This was a freshwater river. Judging by the minerals that are left behind, it was uh, such a pure, clean water. And it was about two feet deep to be able to form the features that we can see. Uh, you could take a glass and dip it down into this water and drink it. So where Spirit landed, it's a hot, briny hot spring, not exactly suitable water for drinking. Other places on Mars, probably shallow, salty ocean or, or shallow, shallow mineral ocean in some way. This was fresh, clean, drinkable water. Pretty cool. Uh, another of Curiosity's finds is uh, this is dried mud. Imagine ponds dotting the floor of Gale Crater. Um, streams may have laced the crater walls running from the from the higher ground up above down toward the base of the crater. Um, over time, you'd see these waterways overflow from time to time and, and maybe dry up and then get mud. The mud gets left behind. I know we've all seen this kind of feature here on Earth uh, in the dirt. And so we, we see this on Mars. So um, pretty amazing to, to start to piece together this history. Um, Curiosity also has a drill on it and they drilled into uh, this mud. And when they pulled the, the drill out, uh, this is, they found out this is clay. You need water to make clay. There is no other way that we know of to make clay than for liquid water to be there and interact with these rocks. Um, but what I think is fascinating, the best part is not, is not only that, when they pulled the, the drill out, it started to lift some of the some of that clay with it, um, and you can see that in kind of the before and after picture. I find that part particularly fascinating. All right, give me just a second. I want to take a drink of tea. All right. In the summer of 2020, Curiosity's science team began uh, moving the rover toward a newer, uh, new region for the for the rover to study, in a in a higher region on Mount Sharp. So this is toward the base of the mountain, a little bit higher up, but looking up toward the rest of it. So that's a pretty tall mountain. And um, what they are heading toward is uh, rocks that are rich in sulfate. Uh, mir minerals, so sulfur-esque minerals, uh, because Mount Sharp was formed as layers of different sediments were deposited by water and wind. The rocks get younger with height, and the sulfate minerals in this region may have formed because Mars went from a wetter condition, forming the clay, to a drier condition that could leave salts and uh, such as the sulfates and other things behind. So that's why we're, we're studying these rocks along the way. We're not finding the same rocks all along. Uh, you want to look for the differences. And again, this will help us piece together the overall history, geologic history of this region. Now, this next set of images I first saw just a few days ago. Um, so this is relatively new. But the reason I want to point this out, these are all, or I think it's all, of the drill holes that Curiosity has done, 29 of them in all. We I said Mars is the red planet, but I also said it's not brick red or stop sign red or anything like that. But take a look at all the different colors of rocks that Curiosity has, has put its drill into. Um, the sediments range from kind of an ochre red to something more blue gray, uh, like on the upper left. And this reflects the minerals and the fluids and things that passed through these rocks. Drilling allows the, the team to be able to get through the, the, the 
part of the rock on the outside that's been weathered the most and 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 has the uh, basically just just has it's it's not as useful information as if you drill into the rock so but i wanted to point this out just for the artistic value of it look at how different just in this one location uh, on mars in gale crater granted it's a hundred mile wide crater but still you take a look at all these different colors and you see all these different rocks and so the geologists are just going crazy um, just being able to study this wealth of information i mentioned that um, the insight lander um, uh, landed to try to figure out what the interior of mars is like and uh, that orange contraption there at the top um, it has a, a robotic arm that it used to put that contraption down onto the surface and then that kind of silvery dome behind it um, was put over top of it. And basically it's a, it's a seismograph or a seismometer. It's, a, it's an instrument to detect Mars quakes. And while they haven't had a big bell ringing Mars quake so far, they have had little ones. And so what they, they want is some of the bigger ones to be able to really determine what the interior of Mars is like, just like we do that on Earth. We don't figure out what the Earth is like by digging all the way to the center of the Earth. We can't do that. How do we do it? We use earthquakes. And a, a, an Earth-wide system of earthquakes basically rings Earth like a bell. And the interior, you can figure out what it's like based on what kind of ringing we get depending on what kind of earthquake we get. Same thing for Mars. Uh, in this case, the, the Mars quakes are likely caused by movement in, in the interior, uh, by landslides nearby. This is um, not a true color image, uh, but this is a landslide or set of landslides nearby that has happened that InSight has detected. And so this is the kind of thing that happens. Mars is geologically active. Not as active as Earth necessarily, um, but we can detect these rumbles and then uh, help to start to figure out what the inside of Mars is like without being able to dig down uh, directly to be able to do it. Almost done. So what's happening in a few weeks, the Perseverance rover um, will land on Mars. So that's Mars 2020 there to the right. And it's a robotic scientist that weighs uh, over 2,000 pounds. And the main goal of this mission is to find evidence that there may have been past life on Mars. Uh, we won't be able to search for current life on Mars un unless it's uh, like a, basically there's a sign there going life here. Uh, that, that won't happen. But uh, we, can, we can study the rocks and look for different things that may give us evidence that past life could have existed on Mars. Um, the spacecraft launched on, on uh, July 30th. Oh gosh, it was either the 30th or the 31st, forgive me. I just had a, a, a brain lapse. It was the end of July. Um, and then it will land February 18th. And so it will land in this place. Uh, again, this is not a true color image, but this is Jezero Crater. And I'm, I'm slightly mispronouncing that. It's a little bit more involved in, in, in the pronunciation and, and my mouth is just not great at, at doing the real pronunciation. So apologies um, for those uh, who may have been, maybe from Eastern Europe, which is the language where this particular crater name comes from. Uh, it comes from the, the Baltic region, or sorry, not Baltic, uh, the um, uh, uh, Southeastern European uh, region. And so the lighter colors in this image represent higher elevation. The bluer colors represent lower elevation. And the circle, the targeted circle, is the landing area for uh, the Perseverance rover. And so uh, where they're aiming for is essentially what looks like a shoreline of a lake that used to exist in this crater that dried up a few billion years ago. The scientists want to visit this shoreline through Perseverance because it may have preserved fossilized microbial life if there ever was any on Mars to begin with. And there may not have been. Um, but what they're going to look for, here's the crater again, overlain with different colors, where the uh, green colors in this picture um, represent, represents minerals called carbonates. 
uh, which are especially good at preserving fossilized life evidence on Earth. Um, and so if you're going to find evidence of life, it would be here. Truly, we don't know if we're going to find any. Uh, but if it ever existed, this would be the likely place or one of the likely places on Mars that you're going to find it. Um, one other really neat thing about this mission is they're going to um, have the ability for the rover to essentially package up some rocks and dust and stuff into these special containment tubes that it's going to leave in a strategic location so that if we ever have the capability to return rock samples from Mars, we will already have the rocks all packaged up. The spacecraft that goes there to do that won't have to do it. All it will have to do is pick up the tubes and bring them back. I made it sound easy. It's not, but um, it won't have to do all of that. So they're going to literally package up some rocks for some future yet to be determined spacecraft mission to return those rock samples to Earth. So pretty cool that they're thinking that far ahead with all that. There will also be a demonstration mission. Uh, this is called Ingenuity. And yes, that is a tiny helicopter. Uh, and actually, I shouldn't say tiny. It's really not that tiny. I think those blades are uh, a few feet in diameter. Um, <laughs> one of the people who was behind the, the, the creation of this demonstration mission, Ingenuity, uh, his name is Bob. Uh, even before people can finish the question, did everyone tell, did anyone ever tell you this was a crazy idea? He jumps in, yeah, everyone all the time, yes, has told me that trying to, to fly a helicopter on the surface of Mars is a crazy idea. Um, but this helicopter is hitching a ride on the bottom of the Perseverance rover. And again, I think you can see my arrow. It's right here. So if you can't see my arrow, it's that bladed looking piece at the far end of the bottom of the rover. So um, it is a 30 day demonstration mission uh, about two months after Perseverance lands, if all goes well, um, they will drop the um, helicopter down onto the surface and Perseverance will roll away and they will attempt to remotely fly this helicopter on Mars. Now, what they're not going to do is have someone on Earth literally like with a joystick, like a video game kind of thing. It doesn't work like that um, because there's a one way light time difference of a minimum of five minutes up to about 20 minutes uh, between Earth and Mars. So they have to pre-program this thing. Uh, but again, it'll be a 30 day demonstration mission. There's a camera on this thing. It will be able to take images, video. Um, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but that's the beauty of a demonstration mission. Whatever happens, it will be interesting. Um, so we'll see if that actually works. Finally, um, terrain is important to get around on Mars. Spirit, the Spirit rover got stuck in a sand pit uh, and ended its mission after seven years of exploring Mars because it got stuck in some sand. Opportunity almost ended its mission not too long after it started because it got stuck in a sand dune. Uh, Curiosity has has experienced getting getting stuck in sand, although both Spirit or uh, both Curiosity and Opportunity were were able to continue on their missions and get out. Uh, but wouldn't it be nice in the future if a Mars rover could identify dangerous terrain before it even gets to it? Um, and that's what a team at NASA's JPL is working on using machine learning. Um, and this is a project that you can take part in as well. I believe they're going to have another batch of data in February. And what they do is basically they, they put a bunch of terrain images on online and people learn which terrain bit is which. They label each of them, each of the images that are in this data set. They upload that information essentially to uh, machine learning and basically you are training a computer to identify different terrain types so that a rover is driving along, it sees what it knows from all of its prior learning is a sand dune and it goes, aha, I'm, I'm not going to drive into that, I'm going to go around it or I'm going to stop and I'm going to tell my handlers back on earth, oops, sand pit here. And so um, they're, they're essentially teaching computers to identify uh, terrain by using human brains to identify them in the first place. And so the first few batches of data, they've gone from the computer 
uh, being able to identify the terrain 40% of the time correctly to now it's over 90%. Um, and so it's called AI for Mars. And if you go to zooniverse.org, you look for the AI for Mars project. And like I said, they'll, they'll probably have another batch of data, I believe in February to go through. Um, so this is a really important set of uh, information because they will use this to train to, for, for perseverance to be able to help it drive itself more successfully on Mars. Okay, finally, what have we learned in sending spacecraft to Mars for the last 50 plus years, almost 60 years? Mars has water ice now, has water ice on the surface, has water ice under the surface in a vast area on Mars. Mars had salty oceans in the past. Mars had hot springs in the past. Mars had flowing water in the past. Mars may have been warmer in the past. Its environment may have been friendlier to life in the past, maybe. But we don't know, did life exist there? Does life exist there now? Where in the world did all that water go? We don't know. Um, what was Mars's air made of in the past? Was it different? Was it the same? What is the interior of Mars like? Many, many, many more questions. So um, exploration of Mars continues. All right, so now it is time for your questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna to go to the chat. Oh my goodness, so many questions. Oh, all right, here we go. What is the website for the Mars Perseverance Landing? So if you're talking about the Adler Planetarium's uh, live, online uh, Perseverance Landing Program, youtube.com slash Adler Planetarium, or just search Adler Planetarium YouTube, you'll find it. And when, whenever we've got a live program going on on YouTube, that's what shows up on our, on our main channel. So you don't have to necessarily dig through the channel to be able to find it. So there you go. Okay, all right, let me go that. Is there a flat Mars society? <laughs> Oh, that's a great question, Jennifer. I love your question. Um, not that I know of. Um, here's the crazy thing. I don't see any complaints that the other planets are round. Why does our planet have to be flat? I don't get it. I don't get it. But I'm not aware of a flat Mars society. Um, so anyway, great question. Okay. Uh, if we could get plants to grow on Mars, water required, obviously, definitely, uh, would that help transform the carbon dioxide to oxygen? The answer is yes, but it would take an extraordinarily long period of time. Um, that's called terraforming. Terra, Earth, making someplace else more like Earth. And so, um, yeah, there, there are many different ways that, that scientists and, and even um, uh, science fiction thinkers and writers have, have come up with, like uh, put dark dust on the on the poles, on the ice at the poles, and turn that into gas. You're a little temporarily thicken up the atmosphere, or or put a lot of mosses and things out on the surface. Uh, anyway, there's there's the sh the short answer is yes, but it would take an extra extraordinarily long period of time to do it. It's much easier and quicker to have us adapt to the conditions there than to adapt the entire planet to us. So, all right. What is the source of the high carbon dioxide atmosphere on Mars? Good question. We don't know. Um, Venus also has a very high carbon dioxide um, uh, atmosphere. And um, so the, it, it may be from the release of carbon and carbon dioxide from volcanoes and the, the rocks and all of that. Um, so that may be it. Our atmosphere at the beginning probably did not look anything like we've got now. It probably over time changed. So is the carbon dioxide, is that the more normal type of atmosphere that you get? Um, or at least the fact that it's different um, shows us how special our current atmosphere is here. All right. What were the inaccuracies in the Martian movie with Matt Damon? Too many to talk about here. There's, there's a lot of good stuff in, in that movie, but uh, I'll give you one. Um, uh, that dust storm at the very beginning of the book and the very beginning of the movie, the whole thing that the whole movie and book is based on, those dust storms aren't, aren't 
that destructive. Um, you know, you're not going to get giant chunks of rock being thrown around the surface of Mars. To be fair, the author of the book very clearly has said, I know I'm getting this part wrong, but I need Mars to work like this for my story to make sense. Got to remember, The Martian is not a documentary. <laughs> it is a movie. So fudge factors are totally fine. All right. When the moon hits Mars, will there be a catastrophic event here on Earth? Meaning when the moon Phobos hits Mars, will there be a catastrophic event here on Earth? Absolutely not. It will just look really cool, I'm sure, uh, to people maybe watching with high powered telescopes and stuff. Um, because Mars is, the Martian orbit is 50 million miles away. That is a really far distance. There is no danger to Earth whatsoever um, uh, of, of a Martian moon hitting Mars or being pulled apart by, uh, by, by Mars's gravity. So nothing to worry about here. Would we smell anything if we were able to smell the Martian atmosphere? Hmm. I have no idea. Um, would there be sulfur particles? Probably in, in, uh, in individual locations. Um, they have detected um, methane, for example, um, on Mars. Uh, although methane, I believe, is odorless, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, don't totally quote me on that. I'm not up on my methane smells. Um, but uh, um, probably in certain locations, uh, maybe the rocks would have a smell or the individual environment might have an, um, an individual smell, just like we get that here on Earth. Um, so, huh, I never thought about that question before. Cool question. When Phobos eventually crashes into Mars, what will happen to Mars? Some extra craters. It's basically it. It will actually get pulled apart by Mars before the individual pieces hit Mars. Um, so more craters. Um, but overall, it's not going to like change the orbit of Mars or anything like that. So uh, there'll be some localized destruction, I'm sure. <laughs> um, whatever particles actually uh, survive going through the atmosphere and won't get burnt up. Um, so there you go. All right. What might be the number one thing we could learn about Mars that would affect our understanding of the Earth? How precious Earth is. Truly, I realize that's a trite answer and I'm not quite answering your question, but I, I'm saying it again. Mars is not Earth B um, or Earth 1A. Mars is Mars, Earth is Earth, and, and they are different. And we are uniquely adapted to Earth. And so that is... That's important. Also, there are some understandings of Mars's atmosphere that can tell us about our own atmosphere. Um, lots of things like that. But a lot of what we're learning about Earth is helping us understand Mars, too. So anyway. All right. What is the composition of Mars's clouds? Uh, water vapor and water ice. Uh, water ice, mostly. Or if uh, uh, Probably totally. Um, so yeah, water ice. Same stuff that we have. It's pretty cool. All right. Yeah, are Mars's clouds made of water just like the Earth? Yes. Isn't that awesome? Um, does Mars have a magnetic field like the Earth? Would a compass work there? The answer is it does not have a planet-wide magnetic field. It, it, it may have in the past, but it currently does not. For that, you need... Um, a, a, a moving iron interior and Mars just doesn't have a, a, a planet-wide magnetic field like we have. Another thing that makes Earth very, very uh, important. Would a compass work there? It would, but it would be really haywire. It would be registering the locally magnetic rocks. So your needle would point in different directions depending on where you're taking it and how magnetic the rocks are that you're, that you're wandering through. So yeah, would a compass work? It would work. It just wouldn't tell you what direction you're going. <laughs> it would just tell you how what direction magnetic rocks are. Um, would not volcanic activity on Mars indicate at least a partially molten area under the mantle? Uh, would the lack of any current activity mean that the molten area no longer be there? Yes. So yeah, you would need a partly molten interior to make a volcano. 
but if you don't have any current activity, it could be that the interior has cooled off or and or the crust is so thick that 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 hot spot can't make its way through. So the interior could still be a little molten, um, but maybe there just isn't enough oomph to get through the, the crust in order to get out uh, through that hot spot. Um, are the slides from 2008 as on screen or 2018, as you said? I don't remember when I said 2018, Doris. So help me with what section. I don't know what, what that meant. Um, so I don't know what that meant. I don't remember saying the word 2018. So help me out with that, Doris. Uh, if you could put a, uh, uh, a follow-up to that question uh, on, on the Q&A, that'd be great. If I said 2018, I apologize and I, must, I might have misspoken. It just depends on what part I was talking about. Does Elon Musk have any true knowledge of space? I don't know. I've never spoken to the man. Um, he definitely has an enthusiasm about space. He has an interest in it. He's able to direct people who have a true knowledge of space. He may not have a PhD level of knowledge, but that doesn't exactly matter. Um, he is directing lots of people who have true knowledge of what the conditions are. So uh, I, I, I would say, I, I, I don't know what his level of knowledge is, but he certainly has an enthusiasm um, about exploring space that, uh, that a lot of us have. Did the lack of much air cause the water to evaporate? That may very well have been what happened to a bunch of the water on Mars. Um, another another place or another mechanism could be that it may have um, uh, some of it may have gone underground and frozen, possibly. Uh, but yeah, as the air pressure uh, decreased, as the air got thinner and thinner over time, the water would have boiled, not due to heat, due to lack of air pressure. You can boil water in two ways. You can light a fire underneath it and, and heat it up. Or you can take your cup of water 100,000 feet above the surface of the Earth, where the air pressure up there is equivalent to the air pressure at the surface of Mars. The higher up you take your cup of water, you have less and less air pressure and you will boil the water away just because there isn't enough air pressure to keep it at a liquid, at a liquid state. So um, that is a way that you can lose water on another planet. So which mechanism was it? Was it a combination? We're not quite sure. So that's that's something that uh, is being looked at right now. You said the average Earth temperature is currently 57 degrees. How much has this increased in the last 20 years? And have you noticed any change in average temperature on Mars since you've been able to measure? No, we have not seen an increase in average temperature on Mars. However, Mars, uh, I'll answer your first part and then I'll get back to Mars. Um, Average increase on Earth is 1.9 degrees since the year 1880. That's 1.9 degrees Fahrenheit since the year 1880. And that is average temperature on the surface of the Earth. Not that every place on Earth has gone up 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Some places on Earth have gone up more than 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Some places have gone up less than 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, but the overall average temperature over the entire surface of the Earth has increased 1.9, or sorry, I said 1.8, 1.9 .8, degrees Fahrenheit since 1880. Um, have we noticed a corresponding increase on Mars? No, because the sun is not the cause of Earth's climate change, and it is not causing corresponding climate change on Mars. Now, I have to qualify that because uh, the difference in distance between Earth and the sun does not have any effect on, um, uh, on our seasons here on Earth, but the difference in distance close and far point for Mars's orbit does have a corresponding difference in the seasonality that we see on Mars. So different systems going on here. Um, so there you go. Yes, Earth's temperature has gone up on average 1.9 degrees Fahrenheit since the year 1880. The photos are amazing. I agree. Um, 
Who gets the privilege of naming the Mars phenomena? Well, it, de it depends. Sometimes there are naming contests, but ultimately um, the naming rights go to the International Astronomical Union. Basically, you can submit a name or a group of scientists usually will submit their proposals for names of stuff. Um, NASA names all sorts of things, but those are those are unofficial names until the International Astronomical Union says, yes, we agree that crater is named for such and such. Uh, that feature is named for this and that. So they get the final say of the names. But NASA is like, yeah, that rock over there, we'll name it for this person on the team. And that feature over there, we'll name it for this town or whatever. So you'll see lots of names, but they may or may not be official depending on who came up with the names. How do you think the water dried up with the temperatures being so cold? Great question. It was prob, I should say, shouldn't say probably, possibly Mars was warmer in the past for that water to be liquid. But that's something else that the scientists have to figure out is how do you have a colder planet and liquid water on the surface? And if it wasn't liquid water, what was it? So, um, so again, the water drying up, you don't need heat to necessarily do that. You can have lower air pressure do that as well. All right. Why does Mars have such a high content of carbon dioxide on the surface? Because Mars does not have a carbon cycle as Earth does. We have cycles of rocks and water and all that kind of stuff here on Earth. Cycles resources through various different processes here on Earth. Mars doesn't have a carbon cycle. And so you end up with a, a carbon dioxide atmosphere and you end up with, with all that kind of stuff and stuff just kind of sits there. Here on Earth, we have a dynamic planet that cycles lots of things through. So um, another way that makes us very unique. Uh, what do astrophysicists think caused the climate change wet to dry on Mars over time? Possibly the loss of atmosphere over time. Uh, but again, yet to be conclusively determined. This was a really long time ago. So um, TBD. How large was the drill bit? Um, basically, I want to say maybe that big. <laughs> uh, that Maybe that long-ish? I actually don't know. It's, it, I, it's it, just think of a drill bit that you've got for your drill out in the garage. It's probably, it's very similar to that. Those holes aren't that big. Um, so yeah. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've thought about the drill bit on Mars. Um, how far did, down did Curiosity drill? Just the length of the drill bit. So pretty shallow. They're, they're, not, very, they're not very deep holes. Um, so the first part of this question I've already answered, but the second part is, could the process reverse turning Mars to a water planet? Yes, maybe. Um, in the future, in the far, far distant future, when the sun warms up and starts to expand, um, Mars will get warmer. Maybe the ice will melt. Maybe its atmosphere will get thicker for a short period of time. I'm talking like a billion years or more in the future. I'm not talking like tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, it certainly looks like Mars has a reddish hue when we look at it at night. If the surface is actually yellowish, what explains what we see? It's that reddish color. Basically, I, I, I just want to make sure people understand Mars is not stop sign red. It is that rusty red color. So that rusty red color is what you're seeing. But compare the color of a stop sign to, to the color that you see Mars at in the sky, and they're not the same red. Um, that's all that I meant by that. Um, isn't seeing the color changes of clay similar to what you would see across different regions of the United States? Yes, we've had different processes, different geological processes in different parts of our country, in different parts of the world. So yes, you will see different minerals and different soil types and, and all that. Absolutely. Yes, important, important to say. What have we learned from exploring Mars that has enhanced our lives on Earth? I will give you an example that comes to mind immediately. Um, there was software that was written um, by the uh, Sojourner rover team to be able to move the rover autonomously a, a bit uh, around on Mars. That software, descendants of that software, 
um, are now running combines on earth to be able for farmers to be able to uh, very specifically plant their fields in certain ways and take advantage of the land uh, terrain and, and um, curvature and all that kind of stuff to be able to plant as much crop as possible in in the in the land terrain that we've got. So the software package that they used for the Sojourner Rover has come down to then help combine operators successfully plant their crops on, on Earth. That's one example, um, but there are many more besides that. Why is past life on Mars a primary scientific question? Because ultimately scientists want to answer the question, are we alone? Are we really the only ones here in our solar system? Was there anybody or anything here besides us in the past? Um, it's not just a scientific question, it's a human question. And so that is something very important for the scientists to figure out um, because we want to know how unique life on earth really is. Um, I think it would be super exciting to find life or evidence of life on Mars. It would show that the universe is just such a dynamic place. Um, I think it'd be pretty exciting. Do the Mars rovers ever come back to earth? Nope. The rovers and the landers and the spacecraft, once they go to Mars, they stay at Mars. Um, the only exception will be once we send a spacecraft someday that we'll be able to retrieve those rock samples, that at least a portion of that will come back to Earth. So that's the goal. No timeline on that, no, no idea of when that will happen. How far from the landing spot will Perseverance be able to travel? I have no idea. That's a great question. It travels. Um, uh, something like about an inch per second, it doesn't travel quickly. Um, the goal is not to travel. The goal is to study the rocks and to be able to move from one place to the next. So it's the goal isn't to drive. The goal is to get to the interesting places and, and be able to study them that way. So I honestly don't know uh, what, a, what an ideal driving distance might be. But curiosity, no, not curiosity, opportunity. Um, drove more than 26 miles in its overall lifetime. Perseverance, I know, is not has not reached that point. It it didn't need to, um, but but Curiosity definitely traveled a long way. Is there any indication of a chemical signature signature of life in the rocks on Mars? No, not yet. But we have found evidence that the rocks and the minerals there could have been. A, a source of, of um, I'll say the word food, don't think plants, just think like chemicals that would be useful for life. So not a chemical signature of life, chemical signature for that area being hospitable to life. So Mars was hospitable to life in the past. The, the question then becomes, how long ago was it and for how long was it hospitable? So yet to be determined. Why can't we bring rock samples back now? Did I miss you telling us? No, you didn't miss me telling you. Basically, because it's really hard and we don't currently have that capability. You need to be able to get something to Mars. You need to launch something to Mars, get it there, land it, then have it have its own source of rocket fuel to get itself off the surface of Mars, out of Mars's gravity, and then get back to Earth and then land in some way. So we don't currently have a spacecraft that can, we have the stuff that can get there. Just getting everything back is a much harder process because you have to take the fuel with you to be able to do that. And the bigger your spacecraft, the harder that is. So how will the helicopter fly with minimal air? Yet to be determined. It has big blades, big helicopter blades for the size and the weight of the craft itself. Um, and so those, those spacecraft, uh, those uh, helicopter blades will spin really, really fast. So we hope that'll get it off the ground, but we actually don't know for certain that it actually will. So to be determined. Does the planet spin on a fixed or moving axis? No, it's a fixed axis. It's, uh, it's orbit or it's uh, axis is tilted approximately what Earth's is. I think Mars is tilted slightly more. Um, that's also how you get a slightly more extreme 
temperature range on Mars is a slightly farther tilted axis. Um, is it, if it has such a low gravity, is its orbit erratic? No, gravity has nothing to do with the orbit. Gravity has to do with the mass of the thing that you're talking about. So Mars has enough mass and therefore enough gravity to have it be about one third the gravity of Earth, but that has nothing to do with the orbit. Um, that has to do with how fast it's traveling and how far from the sun it is. Has Russia sent any spacecraft to Mars? Yes. Um, they've also, <laughs> they've, they've, uh, they've had uh, a lot of their spacecraft fail, but that was like in the 60s and 70s, but um, that was early on in their space program. They had a lot of failures, but yes, they've, they've sent spacecraft to Mars. And I honestly don't have much background on which ones were, were successful. I don't, I can't think of any that come to mind. I know there were, I just don't know. I don't have any information on them. I think they were mostly orbiters, I think. I'd have to look into that some more. Um, short answer, yes, but I don't know an awful lot about the, the Russian uh, uh, spacecraft history. Um, do we know what part of Mars the Martian meteorites found on Earth may have come from? Hang on. Hang on, prop, hang on. I'm gonna get up and you can still hear me. And I'm going to go in here and I'm going to go in this bag. And I wasn't planning on doing this. So Wendy's probably like, Michelle, what are you doing? And I'm gonna go in this box right here. I'm perfectly and, fine with this. <laughs> and I'm gonna open this box and I'm going to open this little container right here. And I'm gonna pull out a rock, this is a piece of Mars. So this is a Martian meteorite. So this is the exterior of the meteorite. So you can see the black crusty stuff. That was the exterior of the rock as it came through the Earth's atmosphere and it melted. And this is the interior of the rock. This broke off of a much larger piece. Um, so you can't really see the, the detail very well. But one thing that I can see when I have this thing under a microscope, you may be able to slightly see it. Do you see sort of a reddish hue uh, in there? That's from the Sahara Desert sand that stuck to the inside of this thing uh, when it landed. So it, the, the bigger piece landed and this little, some little chunks broke off and they rolled around in the sand a little bit. Um, and so this is a piece of a Martian meteorite. And so we know that based on the composition of this rock, it essentially was um, a rock that uh, was part of, uh, of volcanic magma, that, that kind of liquid rock that cooled very slowly under the surface of Mars. So um, anyway, we don't know exactly which part of Mars it came from, but um, we can at least know what happened to the rock or, or likely what process formed it. So anyway, yes, I just happened to have a piece of Mars in my living room because the other planetarium is cool. And this is the stuff that I have. And this is the stuff I use for my job. And um, so, yeah, there you go. <laughs> right now, everybody's like, whoa, wasn't expecting that. Um, so thank you for the Martian meteorite question. Fabulous lecture and photos. Thank you. I love the photos too. Um, uh, on Earth, scientists often drill 2,000 meters into the polar ice caps for samples. Other than surface scrapings for samples on Mars, how far down did they get and what were the findings? Uh, about two inches. <laughs> that's how far down we've gone. Um, basically, those scoops, that's how far down we've gone. We have not been able to go even farther. There will be a rush. Uh, European um, craft called ExoMars, the ExoMars rover, it will have the ability to drill down, I want to say a couple of meters, I think, into the surface. It's going to get to Mars, it's like in two or three years. Um, it hasn't launched yet. It's, it's going to launch in the next opportunity to be able to do that. So, um, so yeah, uh, yet to be determined. So I don't have any information for you on that because we've only gone down about that far so far. What time central on February 18th will the landing program start? Ours will start 1 p.m. NASA's starts at 1.15, uh, but ours will feature uh, the other planetarium. So if you want to join ours, uh, it will start at 1 p.m. central. So we hope you can join us. Was Mars's orbit closer to the sun in the past? Not that we know of. We do know that planet orbits now aren't necessarily what they were in the past. For example, Uranus and Neptune, 
may have been closer to the sun in the past, not hugely closer, but um, so we can't take a look at all the planets right now and say they are exactly where they were in the past. Um, but I don't think Mars, I don't think Earth either, it, it, or a couple of those, I think their orbits are pretty similar to um, uh, to what uh, what they are now. What do you envision our first human mission will look like? It would probably be a very diverse mission. Um, I don't know how many people, two, four, three, more, don't know. The more people you send, the more expensive it'll get and the harder it'll be. Um, really interesting to think, who, what flag do they unfurl first? Uh, who gets to step out on the surface first? Could it be all one gender? Could it be all women? Wouldn't that be cool? Why not, right? Um, but uh, yeah, don't know. Um, we, will, we will see at some point. How did Mars lose its magnetism? Don't know, but likely um, if it had a spinning iron core like we do in a molten exterior, um, likely it cooled off. Uh, don't know for certain. We really need this information about what the interior of Mars really is like now to then start to wind the story back uh, and see what, uh, what it could have been like in the past. How do we know that if we drank the water of Mars that it doesn't contain bacteria that would endanger us? We'd have to probably do what we do to um, water on Earth. You don't want to walk out into the middle of a river and drink that water either. So, um, so you, we would have to sterilize the water just to make sure there isn't some harmful bug in there. But yeah, this is something that you have to think about. So uh, boil the water, sterilize it in some way. Yeah, that's something that they would have to do. So um, unlikely that there's something there, but you never know. You gotta, gotta check it out. Can sound travel on Mars? Yes, just not as quickly as on Earth. The more dense the material, um, the farther and easier the sound can travel. So with there being less air pressure, less air on Mars, the sound won't travel as well. So you could be yelling as you yell on Earth and you would be a lot softer yelling that, trying to yell that same amount on Mars. Oh my goodness, people. Oh, your questions. Holy cow, this is more than I had when I, when I first started answering your questions. Wow, where did Mars's relatively thick atmosphere compared to today come from? Great question. Um, atmospheres may have uh, on the on the inner planets may have come from volcanoes, um, so emissions from volcanoes. Um, it may have been uh, material that was also deposited by comets and asteroids, but volcanoes tend to be sources of atmospheres. So maybe maybe the volcanoes on Mars were a source of its atmosphere as well. When the re when the Adler reopens, do you do public presentations? You are so you are so fun to listen to, and I'd love to bring my grandkids. Um, I run our public uh, public observing program, so you'll see me out at say our one of our scopes in the city programs. We tend to have direct interaction with the public. I don't really do shows and and that sort of thing. Um, I do a lot of library presentations, but on my own time, just because if I tried to do it as part of my job, it would that would be all I did, and I don't want to totally do all that. Um, so uh, yeah, if, if you're going to find me at the at the Adler, you'll probably find me in the observatory or uh, uh, facilitating a telescope or something like that. So um, but no, I don't do I don't do specific like tours or anything like that. But uh, you'll find me from time to time out and about. And we'll bring you back in the fall. Oh, thank you so much. All right. Um, could the carbon dioxide on Venus and Mars come from Earth? No. No, uh, in order for an atmosphere to leak over to something else, they have to be really, 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 really close together. And that just doesn't happen. So, um, so no, they, the, those places formed with, they, they formed their own atmospheres. Um, but isn't it cool that carbon dioxide on Mars is carbon dioxide on Earth? Is carbon dioxide on Venus? Carbon dioxide is carbon dioxide. Just how did it, how did we get it? Uh, how did how did it get there? It's cool to think about. Um, uh, Pauline, thank you. Um, she says thanks for a fascinating event. We really enjoy listening to you. I enjoy talking to you, as you can tell. 
I enjoy talking. Um, can we have access to your slides? My slide deck specifically, no, but you can access basically all the images that I showed um, online because most of them, all of them are NASA images. So mars.nasa.gov. And that's NASA's main Mars site. So that's where you'll find all the images from all the, the Mars spacecraft and, and all that. So um, I can't give access to my slides specifically because they have all my notes and things in there and you don't want all that. So, um, uh, but mars.nasa.gov and you can see all these images. These were, our, your tax dollars have paid for a lot of these. So you'll have access to them. Have they been able to date the rocks on Mars? Yes, so that Martian meteorite that I showed you is about 200 million years old. So, so think about that. The, it's 200 million years old approximately. Um, so how'd the meteorite get here? Something from space smashed into the surface of Mars, dug out some rocks. They flew out, uh, they were going fast enough. They were, they were able to escape Mars's gravity and they traveled through space and landed in the Sahara Desert. So that's that's how they got here. Um, and so the, um, the, the Martian meteorite, that particular one is about 200 million years old. Um, and so there was some sort of, uh, I'll say volcano, but you think volcano and you think rocks spewing out onto the surface. This was activity under the surface. 200 million, 300 million years ago. It's not that long ago, if you think about it. Um, so I've got a um, lunar meteorite in here as well. So, you know, why not? Let's just pull out all the fun rocks. I've got it in here somewhere. Um, oh, here it is. So I love how this one looks like the state of Illinois. <laughs> it just broke in that in that general pattern. This one is about uh, 2.8 billion years old. It's very flat, very, very little tiny piece. They're expensive. <laughs> so that's how much we can afford. Um, by the way, this rock costs five times more than that telescope. So if you're wondering uh, uh, about picking one up for the family, uh, you might not <laughs> there or maybe you will i don't know um there are people that, that sell these things just don't buy them on amazon just don't um nothing against amazon um but go, get a go for a reputable uh uh source so and thank you so much for the for the comments everybody um so yes 230 i don't want to um take more of your time than you've allotted. Uh, oh, that's fine. I noticed there's, let me, let me uh, get through. I think there's five more questions. I can do these. So don't put any more questions in the Q and A, but I can do these. So if, if, if you don't mind, is that okay? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Uh, how do they determine the composition of the rocks on Mars? So you can do it in a variety of ways. First off, you can see, from the light that reflects off of them. You can study that light and there's information that gets carried that way. You can study the light that reflects and that can tell you about some of the composition of the rocks. Some of these rocks on Mars, they've drilled into directly. And so, um, uh, so you can study some of these absolutely directly, but from like a, a Mars orbiter, you can fly over the entire surface and study the light that from the sun that reflects off the surface um, of the planet and then start to figure out what some of the rocks are made of. So you can study them from afar. You don't have to touch them all in order to know what they are all made of. Um, why can't the Mars colony in 2034 have children? Well, first off, Nobody ever said we're going in 2034. Um, oh, wait, maybe that's, is that the Mars, that Mars One colony, those people that are going to go one way? Is that that? That might be that. Um, uh, I guess maybe send the adults first and make sure it's safe. <laughs> um, would you send a kid 
to Mars. I know there'd be a lot of kids who'd want to go to Mars. There's probably some kids we all want to send to Mars. But truly, would you send a kid to Mars? I don't think any of us would. So just from a logical standpoint, you probably wouldn't do that. Um, are there a lot of hills and caves? Yes. And actually, Valles Marineris, um, we can tell, probably has a lot of cave structures and things. That is another place, number one, where you could put a human habitat. You don't have to build a structure. You just go into the cave, seal up the door, instant protection. So that might be some place to look at in the future. But also, interiors of caves, we know on Earth, interiors of caves are great places for life to be. Could that be a great place for life on Mars too? Don't know. Is there daylight and nighttime? What time is it on Mars? Yes, there is daylight, nighttime on Mars. Mars spins. Um, it spins about 40 minutes slower than Earth does. So a, a day on Mars, sorry, a day on Earth is 23 hours, 56 minutes. A day on Mars is 24 hours, 37 minutes long. Um, so yes, day, night, all that. Uh, what time is it in on Mars? Just depends on what time on Mars, what, what place on Mars you are. So they, they basically um, go by sunrise and sunset time. Um, there isn't like a, and, and when the sun reaches its local highest point, that's local noon. Um, uh, but there isn't, there aren't time zones on Mars, for example. So it's just your local sunrise and sunset and your local, uh, noon, and then all split up into equal parts of, of one Martian day. So there you go. And finally, uh, what sparked my interest in astronomy and the universe? Claire Schulman wants to know. So thank you, Claire. Um, I always save talking about myself to the very end. So if anybody needs to go, just go. You won't hurt my feelings. Um, uh, what first started it? Number one, um, uh, seeing Star Wars in the theater when I was four. So summer 1977, that. Number two, my mom being interested in uh, Star Trek, the original series. So she, I had, I watched the reruns and, and all that. So that's number two. Uh, number three, uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos TV series in 1980. And the, um, what that led to was my parents and I were members of the Adler Planetarium when I was a kid. And we went for several years lots of other things after that. So I had a subscription to Astronomy Magazine. I went to space camp, um, uh, all sorts of stuff. So what I really like to end with is if there is a young person in your life, whatever that person is interested in, doesn't matter if it's science, art, whatever, please nurture it however you can. If it's art, buy them some colored pencils and some paper. If it's science, get them a, a subscription to Astronomy Magazine or a membership at, at a local planetarium or something like that. Take them on trips, nurture whatever that interest is, however you can, because I had family members who did that for me. I had teachers who never ever told me, Michelle, you can't do that. Until my, my uh, advisor in college, and then I just asked for a new advisor. Um, and so, um, so I never had anyone say, no, Michelle, girls don't do that. They're like, oh, you like cars and trucks when you're a kid? Cool. Uh, I still do. Um, my husband and I still uh, watch car races and, and stuff. So just whatever the interest is, just go with it and, and do whatever you can to help them out with that. So um, you won't get that interest from one single experience. It has to be layered. It has to be uh, a, a magazine, a book a library pass, a planetarium visit, going to space camp, anything, anything you can do. So that's my message that I will leave you with today. So thank you, Wendy, for having me back. I really appreciate it. Michelle, you are a delight to watch and to listen to. Um, I owe you and the audience an apology. I was told that at some point I was visible on screen eating an apple. Um, and I that was a mistake on my part. I was uh, under the impression I was hidden. So if you saw me, I apologize. Everybody eats. It's okay. <laughs> you were demonstrating, you were demonstrating that people would have to eat going to Mars. 
and we can't currently grow anything there. We'd have to figure out how to get our resources to get from Earth to Mars. You were oh, you were only thinking of Mars when you were doing that, right? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm a little crushed that that the Martian wasn't um, as accurate as uh, one was led to believe. But well, I, I I I too was like that until I read the interview from the author. He's like, no, no, no. I know I got it wrong. I purposely did that. So it's okay. It's all right. No, I, I, I recognize that he, he did it knowingly, but it was, it was a very convincing presentation. And yes, it was. <laughs> He's really good at, uh, at uh, making science uh, really interesting in that way. So, uh, Michelle, I will speak to you privately about subjects for the next lecture. And all right. I ask people what their interests might be, but it was just so interesting to listen to you. And we're all looking forward to watching uh, the presentation at the Adler. Thank you. Fingers crossed for February 18th that Perseverance lands safely. If not, you know what? Space flight is hard and we know this. And uh, so there's no guarantees, um, but we, uh, we hope that works. And all the uh, guys and gals that are on the team, um, uh, just wish them the best of luck. So uh, keep watching. We'll see what happens. Great. Thanks so much. Have a great right. week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.